Uh, our first speaker this morning is uh, Dr. Michael Toomey. Dr. Toomey is uh, a colleague of ours on the uh, second floor at Avery Hall. Uh, he uh, sits in the command office immediately uh, adjacent to the elevator, so everybody gets off and jumps into his office first. So he sort of acts as a guard for the rest of us down the hall, so we're always appreciative of that. The other day, Dr. Toomey this morning is going to talk to us uh, about Lincoln and his religion. Uh, and uh, in the course of some of our conversations about his topic today, I was remind, we, he reminded me that Lincoln uh, had purchased a, uh, a pew in the, uh, on the, at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington. And uh, I said, well, I knew that. He said, well, did you know that he also purchased a pew in Springfield? And I said, no, I didn't really know that. That's good information to have. And it reminded me of a story from my old Uncle Elton who used to tell down in South Georgia. He grumbled constantly, constantly about having to go to church. And uh, at one time, I was a little boy, and I asked him, I, I said, uh, Uncle Elton, why, you don't want to go to church on Sunday, why do you grumble all week about it and still go? And he said, well, it is that uh, um, I can go to church on Sunday and listen to the preacher for about 30 or 40 minutes, and that will enable me to avoid having to listen to Pauline for a whole week complaining about why I didn't go. And so that's sort of the same principle on which Lincoln bought these pews, I believe, because it was easier to listen to the preacher than it was to listen to Mary all week complaining about him possibly not participating. So the, having said that, let me introduce our speaker, Michael Toomey. He studied at the University of Tennessee where he earned a PhD in history. He's a well-known author. His publications have focused primarily on the uh, country's early frontier and the Revolutionary War period. Prior to joining Lincoln Memorial University, Dr. Toomey was the Dean of Academic Affairs at Knoxville College. He also served as curator for the East Tennessee Historical Society uh, Museum. Um, he's been with us for some time, uh, but for 11 years uh, he was the managing editor of the Journal of East Tennessee History. Uh, when he came to the Lincoln Memorial University, he has uh, been responsible for directing the history program and uh, the uh, department chaired the Department of Humanities and Fine Arts. The title of his presentation this morning uh, under Fire, Lincoln's Religion and the Civil War. This presentation will consider Lincoln's personal views on religion, spirituality, and how Lincoln's religious viewpoints may have helped him uh, and, through, and that through him the nation to endure, perhaps even to understand the terrible cost of the American Civil War. So please welcome Dr. Michael Toomey. not high tech. All right. Thank you, Charlie. I appreciate that kind uh, introduction. And I also want to thank you, too, for all your help during the past several weeks and months putting this paper together. Uh, I came to Lincoln by a different route than did some of my colleagues, and so uh, whenever I have a question, I go to see Charlie. He is our go-to guy on uh, Lincoln, and of course, uh, I have spent a lot of time this past week going to Dr. Hubbard, um, and I appreciate that. Thank you. But um, as I said, I came to Lincoln through a different route, through Link a little course called Lincoln 100. Several students in here are nodding their heads, I see. 
uh, you uh, enjoyed that course. It's designed simply to introduce our freshmen to Abraham Lincoln, the life and legacy of Abraham Lincoln, it's called. When I came here um, eight years ago, nine years ago, something like that, um, I was given the task of coordinating uh, all the different sections of that course and um, teaching the bulk of them. And I thought, well, that's fine. I, any American historian that comes through graduate school feels like they know a little bit about Abraham Lincoln. And so uh, I discovered very quickly that that's all I knew about Abraham Lincoln was just a little bit. Uh, he's a complex individual. And the challenge in that course is to make Lincoln relevant, make him matter. And the way to do that, I decided, was to make him personal. Let, let the students see the personal side of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, that's not difficult, because there's a lot of elements of Lincoln's life that we can relate to. He was uh, anxious to leave home, get out on his own. He thought that his father didn't understand him. He had trouble deciding on a career. He was very nervous around women. He had financial problems. He had trouble getting people to take him seriously. And he had instances of profound self-doubt. But perhaps the aspect of Lincoln that um, seemed to intrigue students the most is his views on religion. We don't get to do a lot with that in Lincoln 100. Um, we simply point out that Lincoln held very unorthodox views on religion, and that fact brought him under fire. He was criticized for his unorthodox views on religion by political opponents and forced to defend himself. We don't do much more with Lincoln uh, and Lincoln 100 and his religion than that. In point, of fact, in point of fact, Lincoln's views on religion continued to bring him under fire long after the initial um, instance we, we cover uh, in Lincoln 100. In fact, on the eve of his election, just before he was about to become president of the United States, a group of preachers from Springfield, his hometown, organized a very pleasant protest against uh, the fact that he was apparently going to be elected and the fact that they had problems with that based on his unorthodox and by their way of thinking questionable views on religion. But the greater debate arose immediately after his assassination. Lincoln, of course, was assassinated on Good Friday, which means that two days later, on Easter, every church in the country, or the northern half of the country anyway, was obligated to preach a sermon on Lincoln and attempt to help a grieving nation deal with the fact that Lincoln was gone. That was a bit awkward for some preachers because they were keenly aware of the fact that, as I've noted, his views on religion were a bit unorthodox. But there was still a lot of room with which to work. After all, Lincoln displayed many of the characteristics that are associated with Christian virtues. He did not drink. He did not smoke. He did not gamble. He was tender-hearted a person of very strong morals, and of course he had a reputation for impeccable honesty. It's true that sometimes Lincoln told an off-color joke. Sometimes he even used the occasional curse word. So then again, backsliding is another good Christian virtue. <laughs> and uh, that was held up as a very real asset as well. The Lincoln that emerged during those years immediately after his assassination was indeed probably very comforting to a grieving nation for the very same reason that Lincoln becomes interesting, I hope, to my students in Lincoln 100. He becomes relevant. He matters. There's something to which people can relate, his Christian virtues. But for some, that was not enough. For some people, they wanted him to actually be a Christian. And so in the years that immediately immediately followed Lincoln's assassination, several stories arose to the effect that Lincoln had in fact been baptized four times <laughs> by three different preachers in two different denominations. Another story arose suggesting that he had promised to be baptized 
on the Sunday following his assassination, which obviously was impossible to do. But that story also gained some traction. And so for some people, this version of Lincoln becomes accepted as fact, which was a problem for those people who knew him best, two of whom you see here, William H. Herndon and uh, Ward Hill Lehman. They had initially, in the years immediate aftermath of Lincoln's assassination, thought it best simply to let this uh, new version of Lincoln develop. After all, it did serve its purpose. Herndon was asked about Lincoln's religion immediately after the assassination. His response, the less said, the better. He was inclined to leave it at that, but by 1870, he was unable to restrain himself and launched a campaign to portray Lincoln in what he considered to be the proper light. This was a campaign that would last the rest of his life. His ally in this, Ward uh, Lehman, agreed. Both of these individuals had a good, close, personal relationship with Lincoln. Uh, Herndon was Lincoln's law partner for well over 20 years and had known him before that. Uh, they had had many discussions regarding Herndon felt as if he did, in fact, understand Lincoln's views. Lehman, uh, himself a lawyer, had worked with Lincoln on several cases prior to the presidency, but it was after Lincoln's election that Lehman developed his closest relationship with Lincoln. He was Lincoln's personal bodyguard, stayed with him virtually constantly throughout the ensuing four years. And as a former acquaintance, had numerous discussions with Lincoln as well about a number of topics, including religion. Both of these individuals disagreed strongly with the image that you see portrayed here in Abraham Lincoln, the martyr victorious, um, being escorted to heaven, greeted by none other than George Washington, with angels about to lay a wreath on his head and to go on to um, his, his reward. Um, but as you see, Herndon is going to put forth a different version of Lincoln. Lincoln believed that fate ruled and doomed everything. What is to be will be. No supplications, no prayers of ours can reverse the decree. And that's continued th through to the present day, uh, particularly in the last 10 or 15 years. A number of researchers have tried to reevaluate Lincoln's religion. And um, in some cases, uh, they've actually gone so far as to recreate Lincoln himself and his views. Unfortunately, it happens all too often in uh, people who will seek to recreate the past in such a way so that it supports their own political or religious ideology in the present. Uh, that process, of course, uh, applies to Lincoln as it does to any public figure, but therein, of course, lies the reason that we do these things. We need our public figures to serve that purpose. We need to be able to relate to them. And if, if it's not easy <coughs> to find that point of, of, of connection, unfortunately, some people take the next step and assume that that point is there. And so that's what I want to look at today. Uh, what was Lincoln's religion? Um, now, before I start, it's important to turn to a quote from the man himself. I believe it is an established maxim in morals that he who makes an assertion without knowing whether it's true or false is guilty of falsehood. The accidental truth of the assertion does not justify or excuse him. And that's what we're going to be doing here because unfortunately for us today and for the researchers and for numerous others, Lincoln was very close to the vest about his views on religion. He doesn't say a lot about it. We have to speculate. Um, we will never know whether what we speculate, the conclusions that we reach, are true or false. And even if we're accidentally right, Lincoln says we're still going to be guilty of falsehood. So uh, having shown you this quote, I could perhaps sit down right now and say, that's that. Lincoln won't let me make this, won't let me do this, but I'm going to move on um, boldly and bravely into an area where probably uh, others would doubt we should go. All right, early influences. It's difficult to think that anyone could emerge 
from their childhood without being influenced by their parents in one way or another. Lincoln certainly was. The influence of his mother, his, his birth mother, Nancy Hanks, is uh, minimal probably, although Lincoln himself later claimed that uh, I owe everything I am to her. Uh, he referred to her as his angel mother. His stepmother's influence, of course, is likewise well known. Sarah Bush Johnston was critical in encouraging Lincoln to study, learn, and teach himself if necessary, which of course he did. The influence of his father, Thomas Lincoln, is much easier to, to, to point to. Thomas Lincoln was a free will Baptist, or sometimes called a hard shell Baptist. Uh, this is a denomination that emphasizes a strong emotional presentation and a strong emotional response to religion. They believe in a predestination of the most extreme sort. Uh, God has preordained everything, and there is nothing that any of us can do to change that. Thus, there's no need for missions, there's no need for outreach, or anything that's intended to change people's minds, because nothing can change the preordained plan that God has in place uh, for the world and for everyone in it. Abraham Lincoln was thus exposed to this type of religion in his uh, youngest days. He almost certainly attended church with his father, uh, with his stepmother. Yet when they joined the Little Pigeon Baptist Church shortly after moving to uh, Indiana, Lincoln did not, nor did he ever join uh, the Little Pigeon Baptist Church, or for that matter, any church the rest of his life. Um, he did, however, uh, read the Bible during his younger years, we know that. He read it frequently, he read it often. Nor was he not paying attention during the sermons that he heard at the Little Pigeon Baptist Church. Indeed, uh, he developed a reputation for imitating the sermons he had heard in such a way as to almost border on mimicry of the preacher. It was said he could go outside after the sermons were over, stand on a stump and recreate the, ser the sermon almost word for word, including all the gesticulations of the preachers, much to the chagrin of his father, who apparently saw this as uh, something that was completely unacceptable. Uh, but um, Lincoln never embraced his father's religion, but it does, doesn't go away from him entirely, as, as we shall see. It's when Lincoln moves to New Salem that he is finally on his own out from under his father's influence, <coughs> finally able to um, develop his own ideas, develop his own um, uh, sense of an explanation uh, for spiritual ideas. We don't know much about what happened to him in New Salem. We do know that um, one of the founders of New Salem was a member of the Cumberland Presbyterian faith. We do know that one of the prominent families in New Salem included two Baptist preachers um, who spoke regularly at uh, a church that organized itself and met infrequently in New Salem. There were itinerant preachers that came through town, one of whom was a Methodist preacher by the name of Peter Cartwright. We'll meet him again in just a few minutes. Um, but there was also, as uh, one of Lincoln's earliest biographers has noted here, William Barton, he says, there was in New Salem a rather strong tendency toward what was called infidelity. He says, Paine's Age of Reason and all these ruins were in active circulation. Lincoln read them, and they were not without their influence upon his things. The extent of that influence perhaps is best seen after Lincoln moves to Springfield. In the first year of his arrival there, Lincoln was in a position where things were changing rather dramatically in his life. He'd recently been appointed, uh, uh, certified to, to practice law. He had a partner, John Todd Stewart, and uh, his life was, for the first time, really beginning to shape up into the life that we would ultimately recognize as the life of Abraham Lincoln. Um, shortly after arriving in Springfield, Lincoln met Joshua Speed, who you see here on the left. They formed a very close relationship, and they were two members of an informal debating club that met once or twice a month in the office of James Matheny, who you see here. He was deputy clerk for the uh, county. 
court and um, many, many other young professionals from town would breeze through this debating club from time to time. Um, and they debated all the major topics of the day, the fads and fashions, the new ways of thinking. And of course, in that period, antebellum America, there were dozens of new ideas floating around. And this informal debating club touched on all of them, including religion. And as you see here, these, these three uh, examples we've selected illustrate Lincoln's point of view at the time he arrives in Springfield. Joshua Speed um, very uh, tactfully says, when I fir first met Mr. Lincoln, he was skeptical of the great truths of the Christian religion. Matheny was more shocked. Lincoln went further against Christian beliefs, doctrines, and principles than any man I'd ever heard. He shocked me. William Herndon, who at that time was a law clerk and uh, much younger than you see him here in this picture, he said Lincoln had no faith in the Christian sense of that term. He had faith in laws and principles, causes and effect. He was, in fact, believed in philosophy. Um, but Lincoln's going to discover something about Springfield. Springfield religious community is very different from the religious community in which he'd grown up. There is nothing of the emotionalism that he had experienced in his father's church. Springfield is larger. There's a different version of Christianity there. The churches usually were led by pastors who were trained in their profession. Many of them had a college education much less focus on emotional response. This was a type of Christianity that Lincoln found intriguing, and one that he could actually listen to. He also got married during the time he was in Springfield, and as we all know, that's an event that tends to change a person's outlook about a lot of things. <laughs> Still, there's no indication that Lincoln went with Mary to the Episcopal Church. When she, that was the church she joined immediately after arriving in Springfield, and there's no indication that even she went to the, to the uh, regular services there on a regular basis. But Lincoln discovered very quickly that his ambitions for politics were going to be complicated by his un unorthodox views on religion. He discovered this very quickly. In March of 1843, he wrote to a political ally, Martin Morris, about a failed attempt on his part, Lincoln's part, to secure his district's nomination to be the nominee for a seat in Congress. He learned that his defeat was due in part to his views on religion, as he wrote to Morris. My wife has some relatives in the Presbyterian and some in the Episcopal churches, and therefore, whenever it would tell, I was set down to either one or the other. But, Lincoln says, it was everywhere contended that no Christian ought to go for me because I belonged to no church and I was suspected of being a deist. Those influences, he says, levied a tax of a considerable percent upon my strength throughout the religious community. So Lincoln's learning quickly that his religious views could be a liability in the world of politics. Three years later, he does indeed secure the nomination to run for Congress. His Democratic opponent, Lincoln himself is a Whig, his Democratic opponent, opponent is Peter Cartwright, that same Methodist minister whom he had met earlier, or at least listened to, in his trips through uh, New Salem. Peter Cartwright was something of a celebrity by this time. He was an evangelist, we would call him today, a revivalist. He had a, a following among uh, people uh, among in, in towns where he went. And um, having lost votes three years earlier, Lincoln is determined not to lose votes again on the basis of religion. Yet Peter Cartwright, as an established authority on religion, could conceivably levy, levy charges against Lincoln that would be damaging. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Cartwright started what was called a whispering campaign that accused Lincoln of being a scoffer of Christianity 
and perhaps of being a deist. Lincoln tried to ignore these charges, but ultimately felt compelled to respond. <clears throat> the result is what you see here, handbill replying to charges of infidelity in July of 1846. This is going to survive as Lincoln's only substantial statement about his religious views for his entire life. There will be hints in other parts of his writing. There will be suggestions, and there will be assumptions by people who knew him. But this is the only place he ever sets down in any definitive way uh, exactly what he believes. And sadly, it's really not all that definitive. It's more a negative statement of what he doesn't believe. He is attempting to deny the charges that Cartwright has made. And he says here, in early life, I was inclined to believe in what I understand is called the doctrine of necessity. That is, that the human mind is impelled to action or held in rest by some power over which the mind itself has no control. And I have sometimes, with a few people, one, two, or three, but never publicly, tried to maintain this opinion in argument. If you read the entire handbill, you see that Lincoln is never actually denying any of Cartwright's charges entirely. He's, he's simply giving what many politicians today would call a non-denial denial. He's not actually saying what he does believe. Does he still believe in this? He says he did it one time in the past. He's not saying he doesn't still believe in it. But um, it is also interesting, too, that this document was never discovered until 1942, which means none of the people that uh, would try to reinvent Lincoln in the aftermath of his assassination could have known about this. In fact, very few people outside of Springfield would have known about this because it was, uh, although Lincoln had it printed late in the campaign and then subsequently, after he won the election, felt strongly enough about this to have it republished even after he'd already won. So he was concerned about the possibility of his, uh, his views on religion, what that might do to him politically, and went to great lengths to uh, at least try to respond but this, as I said, is going to be the last time he ever does that. Um, what else changes in Springfield? Uh, as Dr. Hubbard pointed out, uh, he does, in fact, um, rent a pew at the First Presbyterian Church. But there's a background to that. What happened was that their second child, Eddie, dies in 1850. And naturally, they're distraught about that. Eddie's funeral was conducted uh, by the Reverend James Smith, of the First Presbyterian Church. Mary Lincoln was so impressed that she changed her membership from the Episcopalian Church to the First Presbyterian Church and put herself under the guidance of the Reverend James Smith. She asked Lincoln to rent a pew for her in that church, which Lincoln agreed to do. Uh, but he apparently told a friend at the time that he preferred the Episcopalians because, as he said, the Episcopalians are equally indifferent to a man's religion and his politics. <laughs> Even so, he rents the pew and sometimes attends services with Mary, at which point he discovers that he's intrigued by James Smith's sermons. James Smith is one of those educated preachers, and his presentation is something that Lincoln can, can understand, or at least enjoy. Smith also wrote a book, that's the title you see here, The Christian's Defense, a uh, very long title, um, we won't read the whole thing, but The Christian's Defense is uh, a book that in his discussions with Lincoln, uh, Reverend Smith was of the opinion that Lincoln's interest implied uh, the beginnings of an acceptance of Christianity. He gave Lincoln a copy of this book, The Christian's Defense, and as he told a friend, Abraham Lincoln gave his book a searching investigation, is what Smith said. In fact, Smith's optimism notwithstanding is pretty good evidence to support the contention that Lincoln's views on religion have perhaps acquired some depth, perhaps he broadened them a little bit, but nothing much changes really in Springfield. Uh, as John Todd Stewart, Lincoln's first law partner, wrote years later, the Reverend Dr. Smith tried to convert Lincoln from infidelity as late as 1858 and couldn't do it. Um, Herndon also claimed that the little book that Smith had given Lincoln, The Christian's Defense, 
the same book that Smith believed Lincoln had given a searching investigation, was in fact placed on a shelf in their law office and Lincoln never picked it up again. So what was Lincoln's religion on the eve of the presidency as he's about to leave? Numerous, numerous uh, quotations and uh, uh, from people that he knew suggest that it was still remained quite unorthodox. Mary Todd, Mary Todd Lincoln, his, his wife, who would like nothing better than for him to join the Presbyterian Church, suggested that Lincoln was not a technical Christian he had no hope or faith in the usual acceptance of those words. James Keyes, who was the postmaster in Springfield, Lincoln himself had once been a postmaster in New Salem, and tended to spend some time at the post office getting the various newspapers that he had subscribed to from around the nation, and in the process of which had several discussions with James Keyes, who recalled from those conversations, from the gist of them, was that Lincoln could accept the concept of a creator God, a God who was a creator, if for no other reason than because of the harmony that existed in nature. But, says Keyes, Christianity for Lincoln was a system calculated to do good, but in fact something that appeared in somewhat doubtful shape. And the Bible, he said, was nothing other than a collection of pertinent quotations. However, it's important to point out here, I think, that if Lincoln believed the Bible was nothing but a collection of pertinent quotations, those were quotations he used a lot. Lincoln had read his Bible thoroughly. He could quote it accurately, and he could use it very effectively when the situation called for. So, to a certain extent, yes, of course, James Key's recollections of uh, maybe relative, but it's also important to point out that Lincoln did, in fact, understand and appreciate the Bible. Jesse Fell, who was a lawyer and a member of the Universalist congregation in uh, Springfield, had numerous conversations with Lincoln, and as, as did many others, believed that Lincoln's interest and engagement suggested a sort of <clears throat> inclination toward Universalism. Ultimately, he came to believe that Lincoln as he said, did not believe in what are regarded as the orthodox or evangelical views of Christianity. Instead, said Jesse Fell, he claimed that Lincoln's views on religion could be summed up as a belief in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, which is an interesting uh, uh, definition for the views we'll be looking at as we move on here. But if there is one other aspect of Lincoln's religion that is dominant, it is his views on fatalism. This is nothing new. Uh, certainly the predestination uh, theology of his father's hard shell Baptist can be seen here. Even when Lincoln arrived in New Salem, one of his friends wrote, during the first few years in Springfield, uh, after he left New Salem, when he first arrived in Springfield, he believed that Lincoln arrived with a predestined work for him in the world. Even in his early days, Lincoln had a strong conviction that he was born for better things than seemed likely or even possible. When I think he was a man of very strong ambition, I think it had its origin in this sentiment that he was destined for something nobler than he was for the time engaged in. That sense of better things or more important things coming and things over which he himself has no control are going to be noticed and, and, and commented on by several people, some of which you see here. Henry Clay Whitney notes, for example, when Mr. Lincoln was a fatalist, believed the universe is governed by one uniform, unbroken, primordial law. William Herndon, who we've already seen, uh, suggests here, Lincoln believed in predestination or ordination, that all things were fixed doomed one way or the other, for which there was no appeal. And going into the presidency, uh, these things are, uh, by most accounts, the standard elements of Lincoln's religion. But now our next question. Does Lincoln's religion change? Many people believe that it does over the course of the Civil War. And in fact, it's not impossible 
that that would be believed. In fact, how could his views on religion not change, given the terrible carnage that the war produced and his own personal responsibility for managing that carnage? It's not unlikely that his views on religion would, would be changed, challenged, and perhaps even altered. Um, how can we tell for sure? Most people point to um, the event of Willie's death, William Wallace Lincoln, of course. Willie was Lincoln's, I hesitate to use the word favorite son, but certainly uh, he was the most precocious, the most outgoing, and the one that reminded people most of Lincoln himself. Uh, his death uh, in the midst of uh, probably one of the darkest periods of the Civil War clearly hit Lincoln hard, and many people noticed that and commented on the fact that he seemed to turn more toward religion in uh, the aftermath of Willie's death. Um, likewise, at the time of the Gettysburg Address, many people commented on the Lincoln's seeming trend toward religion at that point as well. One, people who, one person who did this was Dr. Phineas Gurley, uh, who was uh, the uh, pastor at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. Immediately after arriving in the capital, Mary persuaded Abraham Lincoln to once again rent a pew in a church, and Lincoln had no problem with that, and in fact found Gurley's uh, sermons even more enjoyable than he had Reverend Smith's sermons. Uh, they were frequent uh, attendees, although Lincoln attended numerous churches when he was, in, in, uh, when he was president. But Gurley too, uh, as had Smith before him, came to believe that uh, Lincoln's interest in his uh, sermons implies some sort of interest in embracing Christianity. And uh, he points to the death of Willie. He too is one who pointed to the um, Gettysburg Address period as a time when Lincoln seemed to be moving toward embracing Christianity. So how do we know if those things happened? And as I've already suggested to you, we can't know. It's impossible to know. But um, as you may recall, a few weeks ago, I had a lot, all of us had a lot of time on our hands. School was canceled here for, what was it, two weeks? And I lived on the top of a ridge, and I couldn't get down. Uh, left all my notes here on campus, because I had no idea I'd be home for two weeks. So what do you do with all that time on your hands? Well, you go to the internet, uh, to Bassler's collection of the collected works of Abraham Lincoln, and you begin to look for all the instances in which Lincoln uses words that imply spiritual, uh, in, an embrace of spiritual uh, view, changing spiritual views. Uh, as I said, I had a lot of time on my hands. And, um, but having done that, <clears throat> it turned out to be an interesting exercise. Now, the, immediately I should note there are problems with trying to understand a person's religious point of view by simply looking at how many times they use religious words. Um, many instances are very routine very casual. The word God, for example, if you search through <clears throat> Basler's Collective Works of Abraham Lincoln for the word, word of God, you see Lincoln saying things like God speed, or for God's sake, or things that are clearly not intended to imply some sort of spiritual awareness or spiritual trend. So I, I pull those out. Um, also, if you're looking for changes during the Civil War, the sheer volume of writing that Lincoln engages in during the war as compared to what he had earlier is going to distort this, this chart. And so it's not really a very realistic view in, ter in terms of percentages. We probably need to go back and apply some sort of math. And since I'm a historian, I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> so, also, there's no way to compare this. What do other people say? How often do people who are pronounced Christians use these types of words? We would need some base comparison. Um, and some of the most revealing statements in here are ones that were collected by reporters, and uh, thus they become.